I want to preach today from this subject, the kingdom is worth the price. The kingdom in this year of the pressers, in this year where Luke 16 and 16 says, uh, since John, now the kingdom is preached, the gospel of the kingdom is preached, and men everywhere presseth into it. In this year of the pressers, I want to preach that, that the kingdom is worth the price. Father, may we do no damage, but preach that which becometh sound doctrine and gospel in Jesus' name. Amen. As we press on in this year, this year of the pressers, it is the will of the Lord for me to continue to emphasize to you here at Upper Room, those who are streaming, those who will uh, hear this on delayed basis, on our various, through our various ministry outlets. It is the will of the Lord for me to stress to you the value of the kingdom, the value of your relationship with God. The value of your staying saved. I said to the praise team this morning when we were uh, sitting together and discussing the lyrics, one of the songs that I uh, wrote is that, the, you know, that a shift took place. I, I remember when most of the songs, the Christian songs, the artist saying about being glad to be saved. Enjoying salvation. Fortunate to be in, the, in Jesus. Got a new walk right now since I've been born again. Praise the Lord. Head got wet in the midnight dew. The morning star was a witness to. Since I've been born again. Just glad to be saved. But over time, it shifted from that to church hurt, my haters. Many describe salvation as a downer. They treat serving God like it's a ball and chain. One of the things that distinguish this ministry from many others is I don't preach to you like you're victims. And I'm not going to do that. And the whole world, ain't, everybody haven't done you wrong. Praise the Lord. We're going to feel sorry for you. Appropriate, but not above that. That's bad for you. That will cripple you. Amen. I'm not going to, I don't preach about your haters and them that don't like you and all that kind of stuff. I don't waste time with that. Amen. Mm -mm. We're winners. Bible teaches that we're more than conquerors. Uh, praise is comely for the upright. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Being saved is a wonderful thing. Amen. There, there's nothing greater you can do than be saved. My life is summed up in three decisions. Three. Decision number one. The decision to accept Jesus. Best decision I ever made. What are your second best decision, preacher? Every decision that every decision that I've made since then that agreed with what God said. Whether, whether who to marry, where to work, what to do, every decision. What's my worst decision? Every decision that I've made that was against what God told. That's it. That's my life. Three decisions. The decision for Christ. Decision to obey Christ, and then bad decisions is when I decided to, you know, I got this, Lord, and to go it on my own. There's nothing like serving the Lord. There's nothing like being in the kingdom. I, I want to stir your minds to show you how blessed we all are to be saved 
and serving the Lord, to, to have a mind to serve the Lord, to worship in a church where you can freely praise the Lord. Amen. How blessed we are to have Christ living on the inside of us. I keep referencing him because I was so touched yesterday. Uh, Elder McNeil said, I, I know everybody else is praying. I, I thought he did a tremendous job prefacing what he was about to say. He said, I know others have prayed. I know others have prayed. And he didn't put anybody else's prayer down. He said, but I just wanted to know for myself that my brother was good and safe. So I went to see my brother and I prayed the sinner's prayer. I led my brother to Christ from Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10. And he said, after he prayed that prayer and his brother Lee prayed with him, he said, he asked brother Lee, he says, where is Jesus? And Lee said, in my heart. <laughs> He knew then, Lee say, we are fortunate for those of us who know that we have him in our hearts. That's a wonderful thing. So this, that, this is what made the kingdom message so remarkable. Yeah. Jesus says the kingdom of heaven doesn't come with observations. It's not like a political party. He says, but the kingdom shall be within you. See, in the Old Testament, unless you were a king or a prophet, you could not be filled or have the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit moved on David. The Holy Spirit moved on the kings. The Holy Spirit used the prophets. But the common man could not have the Holy Ghost. This is why Joel's prophecy was so, uh, uh, so important. Joel prophesied in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. All flesh. All flesh, I'll make, the, I'll, I'll make my spirit available to everyone. Christianity is for every man. The law was awesome, but the law was a set of rules and regulations that men couldn't live up to because the law couldn't get in you. When you get saved in Jesus' name, Jesus moves within. Jesus takes up uh, residence on the inside. And then Jesus says this. He said, now, if you, abide in me and my word abide in you you can have what you will you can ask what you will and it shall be done unto you but you can't visit me and get that privilege you can't come around every now and again and get that privilege you must live in me abide live in me and my word abide in you it is an awesome thing. There's nothing like living for the Lord. Television can hype Hollywood all they want. They're having the golden gloves or something. I think it's tonight or whatever. Whenever it is, I wouldn't waste a minute watching it. A bunch of immoral losers coming together, patting each other on the back, talking about how wonderful they are as they earn a living pretending to be someone who they are not. And they're so proud to be in that company. And like they are the elite of society. They can't stay married. We'll do anything to get apart. Praise the Lord. We'll play any role. And they treat us as though we should look up to them. Please. I'm so great. You're the ones that I look up to. These kingdom heirs. These folk in here who washed in the blood of the Lamb. I'll save young people. I'll save sons and daughters. You are my heroes and heroines. You are my most admired people. Praise the Lord. If I'm going to ask for an autograph, I'm going to ask for yours. I tell the movie stars, if they want one, uh, we'll sign Jesus for them. But they don't have anything to offer us. You are in the kingdom. You are privileged to be washed in the blood of the Lamb. And I want to say today that the kingdom is worth every sacrifice. And all that one gives in exchange for it. Whatever you have to give up to get this, the kingdom is worth it. Whatever you have to sacrifice to remain in this, the kingdom is worth it. Thursday night we studied where the apostle Paul said this. 
in Philippians chapter 3. He said, but what things were gained to me. He said, all those things uh, I counted loss for Christ. Isn't that amazing? He said, the things, that is the things that were in my life that I counted as profit. The things that was in my life that I considered as achievements and accomplishments, I now consider as nothing in comparison to Christ. Also because of Christ, you know, the things that I was heretofore impressed with myself about those things now, I consider them to be nothing. After one gets saved, in many cases, the things that we once considered advantages in our lives, many times we see them for the liabilities that they actually are. Paul in Philippians 3, 3 through 6, give an illustrative but not exhaustive list of things in his life that he once considered profits. And gains toward his goal of achieving righteousness. But now he sees that those things that he thought were a gain and a profit to him. He, he considered them uh, after he met Christ as detriments. As harm, as damage, as things that cause injury. Some of our so-called advantages in this life actually have been used by the devil to draw us away from Christ. Don't think that because you're born into money or prestige or power, you're above Christ. Don't let your beauty, ladies, cause you to feel that you're too pretty to serve Christ. My brother who is built like a Greek god, don't let your physique, Come between you and the Lord. Amen. Amen. Don't allow your level of education to make you think that you are above Christ. Your height that you had no contribution to, whether it's great or small, don't let that come between you and Christ. We should never allow anything in, that's in our lives shouldn't allow Satan to drive us away from Jesus. To allow athleticism, attractiveness, education, money, political and social connections, fame, intellect, talent, family, or anything else to turn you away from Christ those things are not advantages. Those things have become the greatest of liabilities. Don't let anyone swell your head and make you believe that there's something about you that is so wonderful that you do not need Jesus. Don't buy that. Don't buy that argument. They're lying to you. Amen. If I couldn't be a true Christian and play in the NFL or the NBA or Major League Baseball or any of the rest, I wouldn't play. Before I would play at the expense of my relationship with Jesus. If I couldn't be a Christian and work for a Fortune 500 company, Praise the Lord and be a part of the, one of the greatest uh, corporations in the world. I'd take a lesser job and serve my Lord. If I couldn't be a true Christian and be in politics, then I wouldn't run for office. Amen. I'm willing to pay whatever price that has to be paid. Because the kingdom is worth the price. Please say to that person next to you, the kingdom is worth 
the price. It's, it's worth what it costs you. Okay, the guy quit you because he didn't want to date a church girl. You all had it going on. You were doing it all. You were doing whatever it is you were big enough to do. Then you met Jesus and you told him, we, we can't do that anymore. And then he gives you that. Well, by me being a man, you know, by me being a man, I have, I have certain needs. You got to meet my needs or I got to move on. Let him move on. For the kingdom is worth the price. Oh, my. Whatever you give up Jesus for, you, you get the wrong end, the low end of the stick. It's a bad bargain. Say amen. amen. Let me preach to you just a few more minutes. I'm watching the time. But in our text, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 13, we find our Lord coming out of the house, a house, and... He goes by the seaside, and, uh, and, 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 and multitudes gathered where Jesus was. There were so many people, and Mark makes it clear in Mark chapter 4, that Jesus borrowed a ship, and, 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 and the ship became his pulpit. Mark's gospel uh, 4 and, and 1 says, and he began again to teach by the seaside. And there was gathered unto him a great multitude, so that he entered into a ship and sat uh, in the sea. And the whole multitude was by the, by the sea on the land. Can you see it? Jesus, his pulpit is the little boat that he borrowed. Water between him and the crowd. And, and, and Brother Rick, uh, Jesus didn't have Rick to help him out. He didn't have any monitors. You know I would have been in trouble. Didn't have a microphone or a sound system. Stood there. Raised his voice. For he couldn't give quiet discourse because that was multitudes. So then that tells you right there there had to be energetic Loud talking. It was not a whisper. Hey, y'all. A farmer uh, went forth to sow. They would say, what? No, he had to elevate and, and project his voice. And the scripture doesn't give any indication that he used any supernatural powers to do it. So then uh, uh, his message was supernatural, but he preached like a preacher, like a regular man. He stood, and the Bible says that he spoke in parables. What is a parable? A parable is a comparison of a spiritual thing to a natural thing so that that spiritual thing can be better understood. It is uh, the comparing of a spiritual truth to a natural truth or phenomenon so that the spiritual truth can be better understood. The point of the parable is not what is immediate. It's what the parable is teaching. However, parables both reveal and conceal truth. Parables are used to bring the truth to light and parables are also used to hide the truth. It depends on the spiritual condition of the listener. It depends on the desire of the listener to understand. I'm going to tell you something. In order to hear God's message, you have to be all the way into this. See, some of you never get a blessing uh, at church because you don't pay attention. You sit there and you chew your gum. Some of you, you're on the phone. 
Praise the Lord. Uh, you're distracted. You're talking. You know, what, you know what that says to the Lord? They don't want to hear what I have to say. I can't show it to them. Because I'm going to teach you something about God's personality in a moment. I'm going to teach you that the Lord, you know, he wants us to know him, but he, he really wants those of us to know him who want to know him. See, you can't know the Lord. I'm going to really make somebody mad. You can't know the Lord without effort. You're not going to stumble on the knowledge of Christ. You're not going to stumble upon spiritual truths. Amen. You, you, you have to be in the moment all the way and sit beside somebody who came to hear preaching. Praise God. This is not the time in the service to date. This ain't boyfriend and girlfriend time. You're all slumped over. You're in church. And you're here to hear. The Bible says, he that has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit has said to the churches. Those of us who are pressers, the parables is going to reveal God's truth. Amen. But those who mockingly seek to understand, you're here because you were made to come. You're here because you have an ulterior, uh, uh, ulterior motive. You're here for uh, various reasons. You're here to see someone. You're here because it's what you were raised to do. You won't get. It's too valuable. Some things in life cost what they cost. And the seller is not going to cut that price because the thing is too valuable. Praise the Lord. You are not going to buy a Rolls Royce for a Yugo price. It's not going to happen. They're not going to cut that price. They will tell you, you are shopping in the wrong store. Go to another place. Amen. Amen. Because the thing in and of itself is too valuable for that. Amen. Bible says this about the truth of God. Bible says, if our gospel be here, it is here to them that are lost, whom the God of the world have blinded their minds and blinded their eyes. The word here there means misunderstood. Second Corinthians chapter 4. If the gospel is misunderstood, it's misunderstood to them that are lost. Let me tell you something. You've got to be intentional about knowing the God of the Bible. You've got to be intentional. We've got to be intentional about our relationship with him. If we're going to get from him the things that he has for us. Oh my. The prophet Jeremiah said this about the personality of the God of the Bible, and it makes my argument. Jeremiah 29 and 13 says, And you shall seek me and find me when, a broom shout, when, when you have searched for me with all of your heart. That's why many of us don't understand Christ or church, amen, or holiness, or, you know, I couldn't understand for a long time why the pastor preached certain things. I'm thinking, why couldn't you understand? You mean you can't understand why we preach stuff that's written in the scripture? That means you're not pursuing him. Well, pastor, I'm just not interested. It, it's, it's, a, it's an acquired taste. See? So you, got, you got to come against whatever it is uh, in you that, that keeps Jesus from tasting good. For the Bible says, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. See, if it doesn't, if it doesn't take to you naturally, a whole lot of things happen. 
uh, vegetables didn't naturally take, doesn't naturally take to all children. Some like them uh, from the start, but all of them love candy. Praise the Lord. Some things, uh, you have to develop that taste. The Lord says, you'll find me. Oh, yeah, you'll find me. You will find me. You will know me. You will get what I have for you. You will understand the deep things of me when you have searched for me. With all your heart. Brother, get ready to marry Sister Rosalind said, I had to ask her twice. First ask, she said, I'm not ready yet. Need to see something else. See if this man really on the up and up. Let me see you in church. Let me see. Let me see you praise the Lord. Let me see how you are with you. Let, let, let me see something. Because I need to know. I need to know that you really want this. God of the Bible is saying, I need to know whether or not you really want me. See, because I'm not cheap. I made everything. And if puny you is going to know wonderful me, says the God of the Bible, you got to search for me with all of your heart. There are some courses when, when you were in college, there are some courses you knew not to take. Because you knew that it was over your head and you weren't willing to put the work in and the time in to learn the curriculum. Am I right? So you just bypassed that. Well, I wonder how many today are willing to put the work in and willing to put the time in to know the God of the Bible. He said, you'll find me when you put forth an effort. You'll save your marriage. If you put forth the effort, you can turn it around. If you put forth the effort, you can, you can reverse that type 2 diabetes. If you put forth the effort. But you ain't going to reverse the thing with pie in one hand, cake in the other, and then 80 pounds overweight saying, I'm waiting on the Lord. Well, you're going to see him in a few minutes if you don't change some things. Somebody shout, it takes effort. It takes effort. Some of you are just struggling, you're doing. You're struggling in Christ because you're lazy. You're lazy. You're not putting forth the effort. Pastor, I don't understand why it's so hard for me. I do. You're not trying. Satan hadn't singled you out. Why do you think you're that wonderful? Well, what, kind, what, kind, what contributions are you making for the devil to single you out? What are you doing? Have you, you written a volume of books? You, you you want a whole lot of souls? Everybody's following you? Why do you think Satan's singling? Why do you think Satan is singling you out? I mean, what is it about you? No, Satan's coming after everybody. Satan's coming after everybody. The devil attacks everybody. His kingdom comes after everybody. The difference is there are some people who aren't just, they're not just resisting the devil, but, but they are seeking the law. And they're putting their time in for Christ. So when they go through the same attack that you go through, the response is different because one person is busy seeking God. Hey Amen. They know more about the Lord than you know because they've been putting the effort in. They've been putting the time in. Praise the Lord. When I was in athletics and we were training, I, I think about old Robert. I said, now I wonder if Robert doing this. Robert was, Robert was my, when by, uh, Robert Williams, he was my, 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 my encouragement. And I would tell the guys, uh, I said, now I've figured this new, I got this new exercise going. I'm not going to tell Robert. <laughs> Because I want, to, I want to get an edge on him. And, and we, we, it, was, it was friendly banter. But, but, but I, I, you know, I, sometimes I, I would think, oh, okay, I, I, I don't feel like working out. But Robert's working out. <laughs> oh, I know Robert's working out. Robert don't miss a workout. So praise the Lord. If Robert's working out, I might as well go work out. Because I ain't going to let Robert work out. And I'm not working out. Right. Call Robert later. Hey, man, did you work out? I'm at the gym now. I said, I knew it. <laughs> I want to tell you something. Robert's working out. You better put your time in. Somebody's, you better, you better, you better seek the Lord while he may be found. 
call ye upon him while he's near. I'm going to preach to you in just a minute. He says, you will find me when you search for me with all of your heart. I've said many times, I wished I would have coined the phrase, but I didn't. Salvation is not for the passive. It's for the desperate. You who are passive about serving the Lord, laid back with your cool self. You lay out a sin. No passion for Christ. You'll never know him. You'll never know him. You'll never know what it's like to enter into the inner sanctum of the Lord. You'll never know what it's like to be going through the storms of life and not feel it. Because he builds a fence. You'll never know what it's like to have the blessed assurance that if I don't wake up, in the month, everything will be all right. You'll never know what it's like to go through death, hardship, pain, and suffering. Maybe the doctor told you that they found cancer in your body. you never know what it's like to hear, to hear the Lord whisper in your ear, I got this. The doctor look at you and say, oh, did you hear what I said? Yes, I heard you. Oh, let me write him up. So and so is in denial. Oh, no, 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 doctor. I'm not in denial. I heard you. I heard you. But, but, but along with your voice, I heard something else. I heard someone else. And, and, I, well, where you, I, I, and I can't wait to leave here because at my church, they allow testimony service. And... Uh, and I'm gonna, I can't wait to get there so I can sing, I got a feeling. I heard what you said, but I have a feeling that everything will be all right. Why? Because I have a relationship. Now, does the Bible teach this? The Bible says, let your moderation be made known to all men. The Lord is at hand. What is moderation? Self-control. Let, let people know why you are not falling apart. Let people know why you're not losing your mind. Let people know why you're able to go through like a champ. Why? Because the Lord is with you. But you'll never know this if you don't seek him and search for him with all your heart. When one is not saved, you who are lost today, they miss it altogether. This is why you can't have unsaved people teaching Sunday school in the church. This is why you can't have unsaved church officers. Amen. Ushers, ushering on the floor and hadn't been born again. Smelling like pal mal. Some things, juicy fruit, spearmint, and double mint don't hide. Right. Right. Hadn't been washed in the blood, not saved, but singing on the choir, playing instruments in the church. They may be good people. They may be nice people. They may, may be mighty fine people. They may be accomplished people. They may be rich people. But until they get saved, they're lost people. Until they're, until you're saved, you're not. And the Bible teaches that the unsaved man receives, the, do not understand the things of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 14 says, but the natural man receive not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. And neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. Natural man there means unsaved man. When you hadn't been born again, you can't understand the things of God. I just don't understand church folk. I just don't understand this. I just don't understand that. You might need to be saved. That might be the problem. Because once you get saved, you understand this. You see it better. And then don't get saved and go to seeking it now. Then everything becomes open. Now that's when you're really woke. <laughs> that's, that, that's when you wake up. Because the God of the Bible opens your eyes. 
Let me preach the text for a few minutes here. The parables of our text, parable of the hidden treasure, and the pearl of great price. In theological settings, what we see here is called a pairing. Matthew would do this quite often. He would pair parables. This pairing was designed to reinforce the point. The two parables here in our text make the same general point. And that the point is uh, that they have the same significant individual emphasis. And it deals with the superlative worth of the kingdom of heaven. It deals with the value of having Jesus and the kingdom of God operating on the inside. Are you with me? Praise the Lord. The kingdom, the kingdom that John preached. I said it to you earlier. The kingdom that John and Jesus preached. The kingdom that when John was put to death, that Jesus continued to preach. The kingdom of heaven is within you. Then, then Jesus taught us to pray, God, uh, 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 thy will be done. Thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Good God Almighty. Now listen to this, this, this pairing. Now in our text, first we see the, the parable of buried treasure. Are you with me? The text tells us something. It says again, verse 44, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a treasure hid in a field, which when a man hath found, he hideth, and for the joy goes and sells all that he has and buys the field. Barclay said this, in the ancient world, there were banks, but not banks such as ordinary people could use. Ordinary people in the ancient world used their land. They used the ground as banks. They buried their goods in the ground. Praise the Lord. The safest place, one rabbi said, uh, the safest repository for money, the rabbi said, is the earth. So people, not just poor, people uh, rich and poor, Buried their treasures in the ground. But in a land where a man's garden may become a battlefield overnight, uh, this made for a lot of buried treasure because Palestine was one of the most uh, fought over countries in the world. So people would bury their valuables. When they saw war coming, many times to flee, uh, and to be able to run swift, they would take their valuables and bury them, hoping that after the war was over, they could return home and dig up their valuables and go on with their lives. The historian Josephus says this. He said, the gold and the silver and the rest of the most precious furniture which the Jews had and which the owners treasured up underground against uh, the uncertainty, the uncertain fortunes of war, end of quote. They would bury their goods. Now, the rabbinical law was that if a workman came on a treasure in a field, he found it, a workman, a slave, stumbled on a treasure in a field, if he lifted the treasure out of the field, then the treasure belonged to the owner of the field because it's his field. And everything in his field is his. So if you go on his field and you find buried treasure in his field, then if you are a person of integrity, you got to give him the treasure because you found it in uh, his field. But if you found the treasure and left the treasure where you found it, 
and then went and began to sell everything that you had. Leverage all of your finances. Borrow money from a few neighbors. Do whatever you have to do to come up with the money, praise the Lord, uh, the price for the field. And you got the owner to sell you the field. Then the treasure in the field is yours. Because now you are the new owner of the field. Good God Almighty. Jesus was saying the kingdom is that treasure hidden in the field. And no matter what sacrifice you have to make to buy the field, the, the kingdom is worth the sacrifice. See, when the man found the treasure buried in the field, he recognized its worth. That's why he got happy. So I'm wondering whether or not we recognize how blessed we are to be in Jesus. See, some of you want to be a five percenter. You want to, you, 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 you're thinking about going Muslim. you you're trying to mix it with a little Hinduism and all this, but there's a group in here who realize that this thing, biblical Christianity as it is, I'm not trying to change the faith, the church as it is, I'm not trying to change religion, I like it the way it is, that this thing is of invaluable worth. So when you realize that you're in something of great worth, the first thing you do is you get happy because you know that you're fortunate. To be a part of it. Well can you see that man. Having stumbled on the treasure. In the field. First thing he did was. When he saw the treasure. He looked right. He looked left. He looked all around. To see if anybody else. Was around to see what he found. And he said. Oh my God. This is my day. I got to find out. How much this field costs. I might have to sell my car. I may have to give up cable vision. I may have to give up, praise the Lord, going out to eat every night. I may have to give up, hallelujah, the cell phone. Oh Lord, I may have to lay this aside and lay that aside to come up what I, with the money that I need to buy the field because there's a treasure in this field. I wanna tell you that in serving Jesus, Sometimes it will cost you your friends. Sometimes it will cost you popularity. Sometimes you have to walk alone. Sometimes you have to be misunderstood. Sometimes you'll be lied on, cheated, talked about and mistreated. But I'm here to tell you that serving Jesus is worth the sacrifice. Do I have anyone here who have discovered that it's just worth the sacrifice? I got people who don't call me back anymore. They left me alone when they found out that I was saved. Go on goodbye. It's worth the sacrifice. They don't invite me to certain parties. They don't invite me to certain gatherings. My name is no longer popular in that group. But it's all right because my name is popular in heaven. You need to recognize today that no matter what Satan tries to sell you, no matter what Satan tries to do, you're in the greatest position that there is because you've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. My brother, she's not worth it. My sister, he's not worth it. Stay with the Lord. Hold him with both hands because he's that treasure buried in the field. How many have discovered that wonderful treasure? Is it worth it? Is it worth it? 
do you find your relationship with the Lord being worth whatever it has cost you to have that relationship? Are you in a position where you can stand up and say to the world, I'd rather have Jesus, good God Almighty. If that's where you are, lift your hands and say, Lord, I thank you and rejoice in your salvation right now. Praise him all over the church. Praise him all over the church. And then the next one. See, he had something. He had something. He bought the whole field. The field in the field. Field. That was stickers, briars, sand spurs, snakes, all kinds of things in the field, in salvation. You'll get your feelings hurt. You'll get talked about. They'll lie on you. People will turn their back on you. They'll fall out with you for a little or nothing. That's the field. But my Jesus is worth the field. I'm not leaving the field. I bought the field so I can keep the law. I will put up with some of the stuff. I'll put up with the games. You have to put up with all the other things because Jesus is worth it. Do I have anybody who will say Jesus is worth it? No, my church is not a perfect church, but I got healed in my church. I got blessed in the church. I got anointed in the church. So what? I found some hypocrites in the church. I found some liars in the church, but I found a treasure in the church that's worth all of the other things. Yeah, yeah. Somebody praise the Lord for the treasure that you have. Let me close with the second one. The second parable is the parable not of a man who stumbles on a treasure, but the parable of a man who was intentional. He was a merchant man. He was a businessman. He was a professional shopper. This man knew what he was looking for. He scoured the world looking for pearls seeking goodly pearls, trying to find the best pearl that he could find. In the ancient world, men were fascinated with pearls. They loved to touch pearls. They loved the beauty of pearls. And people would pay top dollar for the pearl. Good God Almighty, our merchant man, while looking for goodly pearls. He wasn't looking for stones. He wasn't looking for rocks. This will make sense in a minute. But he was looking for pearls. Looking for goodly pearls. While trying to find beautiful pearls, he stumbled on the greatest pearl. He found the pearl of great price. Not looking for bricks, not looking for stones, not looking for rocks, but looking for pearls. And he found the pearl of great price. What does the pearl represent? The pearl represents the world of religion. You see, this merchant man, he wasn't looking for drugs. He wasn't looking for liquor. He wasn't looking for the nightlife. 
he had elevated his mind. He was looking for the finer things in life. He was looking for pearls. He was trying to find the best religion. He was trying to find the truth above all truths. Well, while he was looking, because see, you got to realize, not everybody even want to smoke dope. Not everybody want to do drugs even before they got saved. Not everybody wanted that life. Some people wanted the finer things. They wanted better for themselves. And they began to look and they tried a self-help, but that didn't work. They tried the Jehovah's Witness movement, but there was no power there. They tried Islam, but they got tired of being mad all the time. They tried Buddhism, but they, they got tired of knowing nothing. They tried Hinduism, but they got tired of all them demons and devils. While looking, they found the answer. They found the pearl of great price. I found the answer. His name is Jesus. How many have found the pearl of great price? And when you found Jesus Christ, you let Islam go. You let Buddhism go. You let that self-help stuff go. You stopped trying to be a life coach and became a preacher. You gave up on the world and said, I'm glad to be in this. I found the pearl of great price. And when he found that pearl, he sold everything he had and bought that pearl. How many in here are willing and ready to sell out? Sell out! Sell out! Brother Justin, sell out for the Lord! Tell the Lord I'm going to serve you for the rest of my days! Lord! Whatever the price, Lord, whoever the price, Lord, however the price, I found the pearl of great price. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah. Shake somebody's hand and tell them, Jesus is worth the price. Somebody just praise him in here. Uh -huh. oh, Lord. I'm glad I'm saved. I can't get any help in here, but I'm glad that I'm saved. Many are glad to be saved, saved, and glad about it in the house of God, and glad about it, sanctified, and glad about it, living holy, and glad about it. Somebody wave your hand, thank God for the joy. Ah! the joy, oh, the joy that comes from knowing Jesus, hallelujah, I'm done, but shake somebody's hand and tell them he worth the price, the kingdom is worth the trouble, yeah, whatever you got to pay, Whatever you got to pay, he's worth it. Whatever you got to give in exchange, he's worth it. Whatever you got to give up, 
to follow him. He's worth it. How many know when you made a good deal and you bought something? Hallelujah. You know, ladies, sometimes you're watching that dress. I told Sister Suzanne the other day, I said, Sister, Sister Suzanne, that's a nice uh, skirt. She said, Pastor, when I first saw it, I didn't like it. Said, but I watched it. And I watched it. And I watched it. And then she said, the price got down to a certain number. And she said, then I loved it. And I bought it. And she felt good about that purchase. Well! One Sunday morning, I made a deal. The Lord saved me, and I feel good about what I paid. My friends walked away. Some of them stopped speaking, but I'm glad. How many are glad today? Glad to be in the number one more time. If you're glad to be saved, Wave your hands. If you're glad to be saved, say amen. Hey, Lord, I'm glad. Hey, oh, Lord. It's worth it. It's worth it. It's worth it. It's worth it. It's worth it here. And it's worth it up there. It's worth it. Woo! God Almighty. It's worth it. It's worth it. It's worth it. You may ask me why I serve the Lord. Is it just for heaven's gain or to walk the mighty streets of gold and to hear the angels sing? Is it to drink from the fountain? that never shall run dry? Or is it to live forever in that sweet old by and by? But if heaven never was promised to me, like it wasn't promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. See, the Old Testament saints, they serve with no knowledge of the hereafter. Biblical Christianity brought in the concept of heaven and forever. They served him. Remember, because when you read Solomon's writings, you know, he talks about how the dead know if nothing and how there's no praise and nothing in the grave where they go because their revelation was limited. And yet, they subdued kingdoms. Stopped the mouth of lions. Good God Almighty. Did all those things, not knowing that there's a heavenly home waiting for them. God Almighty, if heaven never was promised to me, neither God's promise to live eternally, it's been worth just having the Lord in my life living in a world of darkness he brought me the light oh he's been my closest friend down through the years and every time I cry he dried all of my tears y'all know that song 
Andre, it's been a while just having the Lord uh, in my life. They know it. Living in a world of darkness, he came along. I was lost but living. He came along and brought me the light. I was lost in living. But Jesus, ooh, living in a world, he brought me the light. I'm glad that I'm saved today. I'm glad that I value what I'm in. If you're saved and you value this, stand on your feet. I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you. Father, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, we talked Thursday night about a change of mindset. How we got to change our mindset. Oh, God. Change our mind. Change our sight. Help us to see the advantaged position that we're in. Oh God. We, we repent, Lord. Because, Lord, we have at times been guilty of treating you like salvation is no big deal. Like being a kingdom air is nothing to call home about. As a matter of fact, some have stopped calling home about it. When we call home, we call home and we talk about carnal things. We, we talk about worldly things. We don't talk about what you're doing and oh, your goodness and kindness. And then we will talk about it if we get an extraordinary miracle, but just your everyday goodness, Lord. We, we repent, we repent. Oh, we want to start the year out right, Lord. We want to start the year correctly. Start the year correctly. Valuing our relationship with you. Valuing our relationship with you. The Lord will test us all. He will come at certain times in our lives, I'm prophesying, and he'll say to you, what do I mean to you? And you'll say to him, Lord, you mean everything to me. And he will say to you, give me this. Give this up for me. Let that go. Let this go. The next move is yours. Hallelujah. The greatest oxymoronic statement in existence. A greater oxymoronic statement than same-sex marriage. You know the great, a greater one than that? No Lord. You cannot Tell your Lord, no. Lord means ruler. You do what your Lord tells you to do. If he's your Lord, there is no place for no Lord. When you get your yes, Lord, moment, tell him yes. For one yes, Lord, with the Lord, can change your life forever. He woke me up one morning in college. I don't share this often because I don't want some student who is struggling to think that God is talking to them and assume that God deals with everyone the same way. Right. But I'm on the football team. I'm starting. I'm at the top on my level. For the Division I, 
I was turned down because I had uh, something that blocked me that I couldn't do anything about. For the position I played, I was not tall enough. For the NC states and schools like that, that was the reason. So I went, I, I couldn't do anything about that. But I was number one in my position. The God of the Bible woke me up one morning and said to me, Patrick, your football playing days are over. Go home, get a job in the meal, and marry Pam in about three or four months. Your days of doing this are over. Your days of dressing like a preppy college student, you're going from that to cotton meal gall. You're going to take off them slick shoes and put on broke hands. Your nails, your hands will be dirty and filthy from cotton. You will smell like cotton. Your dorm, another will take. Good God Almighty. Your mama is proud of you because you're the first one in the family to go to college. You're the first uh, boy in the family, my mama's family, my, my, my mother's, all of my mama, my, my aunts, all of them. First, I'm first one, the first one to play sports, play, play organized ball. Everybody's proud. The Lord in the midst of all that says, go home. And he didn't send me to grandeur. He didn't say, I want you to leave and I am going to set you on high. No, he said, go to the meal. I went to Martha Baum plant, a J.P. Stevens plant, and I applied. They turned me down. I went back because that's where he sent me. Second time I went back, this was in 1980. Uh, I said to them, 79, 80, somewhere in their line, I said to them, I don't want a summer job. I'm not going back to school. Judge, at that time, they saved their summer job for white boys and girls who were going back. If blacks were going to go back, get a job to, you know, carry them through the summer so you can go to school, we couldn't get that job. When they found out that I wasn't going back, they said, okay, he's at a dead end street. We're hired. They hired me to be in the spin room. You know anything about cotton mills? I, Worked in the spin room. People who shake my hand notice that my right hand is very coarse. My left hand feels like, like everybody else's hand. I, I put lotion on and all that. It's just, but uh, it's, it's a testimony. I was working in the spin room way back in the back, and a spool got caught in the spinner. I reached in to get the spool out, and the machine in that way, caught my three fingers, snatched my hand in it, and blood and skin is just coming out. I'm trying to reach under to cut the thing off, but it had pulled me so far in that I couldn't uh, cut it off. That's why there ain't no, ain't no point in anybody in any other religion talking to me. I called on the name of Jesus. Now, if you know anything about a spin room in a, cotton, in a cotton mill, it's incredibly noisy. So you could scream and nobody would hear you. And if you're at the back, nobody would really, it, it, it would, the person next to you wouldn't hear you. Jesus heard me. Yes, sir. And he stopped that machine. I, t I, I, I took my fingers out and just half, he was so good, let, let a lot of it grow back. Half, just skin and everything, just, just missing and I'm bleeding, uh, uh, and you know, I, I went to the canteen, but you know, it's a little different now. Uh, we, went back, we, we went back to work. <laughs> I got a family, you know, I got, you know, I, you can't go home because you like lost three fingers, you gotta go to work. I'm hourly, I'm hourly. I'm paid every hour. I got, I got Crystal's a baby, Patrick wasn't born yet, Pam, she's working, I'm paid every hour. I got to work. Wrapped it up, and then, and, then, and then part of it is you had to keep 
dipping your finger in water to, to do some of the work. So, you know, tell them what kind of everything, Lord. And look at my hand. God spared me. See? But, but, he, but he called me. He called me from being a cool college student with my hair cut, good razor line, in a, in, in a dorm, to a meal. I asked Pam to marry me. Don't envy the stones that she wear today because she's worn one where it took a magnifying glass to see it. But she loved it because I gave it to her. My little, my little engagement ring. I can tell you where I bought it from. I bought it from Helms Jewelers. Oh, I remember all that. In, in Rockingham. A little bit of, you know. But she just, she treated it like it was she, she treated it like it was what they are now. God is good. See, sometimes, every now and again, I like to let you know where I come from. That's right. That's right. It was! That's right. It was that yes! I took my shoulder pads, hung them up thigh pads, knee pads, hip pads. My helmet turned in my clothes. And as I was walk, I'll never forget, the last day on, on the campus, went by the little prayer room where the Christians were gathered. And as I walked away from the campus, I stopped and I looked back. And tears filled my eyes and God said, follow me. I'm so glad today. I'm glad, I'm glad, I'm glad. So when I write my songs and I sing about being glad, get glad with me. I'm glad, I'm too glad to be mad. I'm too glad. I'm too glad. Too glad. Too glad. Because I had nothing. I had no chance. I had nobody. Me and Pam, we didn't have, there's no, there's no money, there's no, there's nobody. It was us and the Lord, and we followed the Lord. Oh, we had a great pastor. I'm talking about, when I say nobody, I'm talking about, we didn't have anybody in the family who could really help us. I believe I stand before you with this, because I told the Lord yes back then. I told you my best decisions was my decisions to obey God. Here's when you know you're following God. When the vision is just beyond your grasp. As long as you can see it, it's not God. As long as you got it all figured out, all the I's dotted, all the T's crossed, and all that. God hadn't given you that. He hadn't given you that assignment. He gives an assignment that you can't see. He'll tell you, obey me. Obey my voice. But I'll tell you this. That was a kingdom move. And the price I paid. You know how it is when you go back home? People whispering. We didn't think it was going to make it anyway. Who did you think it was? Oh, and that, that man ain't going to be nothing. <laughs> hey, college boy. And I'll never forget. Let me share something. And I'm done. I'll never forget one day I was coming home from the factory. And uh, on my way to the trailer park where we were living, and uh, I looked in my rearview mirror. A brother who was a friend of mine who had, uh, had that I met when I was in college had gotten married, and three of the brothers they were upperclassmen, so I knew them, but I didn't hang with them. I, they had come down 
to the Hamlet, Rockingham area to be a part of his wedding. And I'm on my way home and I look up, I look in my rearview mirror. And I'm following God and said, what were you driving? I was driving a 1972 Chevy Vega that my brother-in-law, Kenneth, gave to me and Pam. Pam and me. And those Vegas were one of the worst cars ever made if you bought them brand new. He was around the third owner and we were around the fourth. The, the aluminum motor had already warped. And here I am, a year or so ago, I was in college. Now I'm in a Vega, slowing down to make a right turn to go up into the trailer park. And I look in my rearview mirror, and there was Titus, Donald, and another brother from college. And they, they had just left the wedding. And man, they looked good. They had their tuxedos on. I could see the bow tie. I recognized them, they didn't recognize me, and believe me, I did not make myself known. <laughs> I turned in and heard God whisper, follow me. Somebody lift your hands. See, if you follow him, he'll make everything all right. In 2018, we're going to press. We're going to press in this. I heard Solomon say, better is the end of a thing than the beginning. See, when you press, he'll make a way. He'll bring you out. He won't show you everything. Glory. But if you just follow him. Last thing and I'm done. David described God's leadership ability, his word, not as a flashlight that can see way in great distance. But he said, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light to my pathway. That is, it sheds just enough light for you to see the next step. Somebody give him praises in here. Good God Almighty. Woo! Can I get a praise? Will you give God praise in the building? Won't he make a way? Mm, it's been worth Living in a world of darkness. Yeah. Clap your hands for Jesus and give God praises. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. 